everyone. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for taking time out of a busy Monday night schedule to hear um, uh, my thoughts uh, on the better solution for ACL reconstructive surgery. So again, uh, clearly consulted for MEOC, important information. Bottom line here is that we're going to give you a demonstrated uh, view of the bare implant. Uh, we're going to certainly show you a bunch of images as well, all of which uh, we have permission from patients to be able to share. Uh, this, a lot of this will be my opinions on, on the reasons and commentary for why I've chosen to add the uh, bare implant to my ACL um, uh, uh, armamentarium and uh, go through the process for this as well. So. The bare implant, the bridge enhanced ACL restoration implants is designed to heal a patient's torn ACL, which is really a very unique concept for us. I've been doing this for 27 years at this point, and we all were told pretty much that the ACL doesn't heal and you got to have to uh, reconstruct, it, reconstruct it in order to have a good result. Uh, and I think that this concept of, uh, of uh, healing of an ACL restoration is one that really is quite new. It's unique and it's different, and it can actually go against a lot of the things that we've learned over the last uh, several decades on ACL surgery for sure. But this technology, again, is going to demonstrate how we're going to restore the ACL. It's an innovative treatment for ACL tears, the, probably the most innovative in my clinical time in practice. And I wanna stress, I think this is actually very important. It's the first de novo in sports medicine, FDA approved, medical device. So this is not FDA cleared. It is not based on a 510k predicate. This went through a pre-market approval process through the FDA, that arduous process of demonstrating preclinical data with Martha Murray, and then passing through into both um, a, a study, the BEAR-1 study, which was a feasibility study, and then into level one evidence demonstrating the safety and efficacy, uh, which then led to FDA approval for this device, which I think is one of the main reasons that we're all here, right? I'm looking up on the screen right now. I don't know how many people we have here, but there's severe, you know, really significant interest, both at the patient level as well as at the physician level. And at this point, literally, you know, I have patients calling my office uh, saying, uh, uh, stating that they've heard about this new implant, they're interested and they want to have more information. And that's really quite unique. In my clinical practice, again, you know, I don't have people coming in and saying, hey, will you use this anchor or will you th use this device? As a general rule, people come to you for your, for your counsel and recommendation, but this is really becoming sort of a mainstream uh, process that people are talking about. So uh, again, something to really consider. And again, this is not a new medical device that comes out, for example, gets FDA approval, has really no randomized controlled uh, trials or basic science data behind it, and it's a leap of faith for people as a first-time user to be able to use this. There are over 600 patients that have been treated with the bare implant since 2015. There's extensive evidence-based uh, data uh, of 45 preclinical studies done on the animal studies demonstrating that this bovine collagen uh, can attract fibroblasts and create a restoration process. Level one and level two evidence with published data at two years with uh, very promising data that's gonna be coming out uh, for six year data as well. And Dr. Kiapor will be discussing uh, some of the, the advantages of, of that as well and what may be down the road. Now you have the Bear Moon trial, which is gonna be the Bear implant versus BTB in a randomized control trial. That's ongoing and enrolling. And then the Bear 3 study is a label expansion as well. And there's a, a registry going on as well. This is a well-studied implant that uh, certainly takes a leap of faith as a clinician to be able to offer something new to your patients, but it is not based on uh, promises and empty promises. It is based on a lot of basic science and clinical data to suggest that this is an option for your patients. Again, multiple studies here. We're not going. We're going to spend too much time in this slide to say that there were, you know, preclinical studies demonstrate a lot of animal studies. The bear one was a feasibility study. Ten patients got the bear. Ten got the hamstring. Taking a look primarily at safety. The bear two was the pivotal study that was used for level one evidence for FDA approval. A hundred patients. They were randomized into either autograft or use of the bear implant. You can see the, the standard endpoints here, IKDC and AP laxity, two, six, and 10 years. The BEAR-3, the level one cohort here, is really looking to expand the label to 12 years and up, as well as looking at partial tears. Technically, partial tears are off-label use for the implant, but you can have that discussion with your patients. And then the Bear Moon, which I think is a very exciting study, where you're looking at a randomized controlled trial at this point, 
where you're looking at B2B autograph, the gold standard, if you will, versus the bear implant out to a two-year follow-up, and they're still enrolling, and it will still be out to 2026 before we get that data. Uh, so the issue is, I think we all recognize that ligaments that are outside of the knee joint that do not have synovial fluid to surround will typically allow for a bleeding event that occurs. The bleeding uh, releases, you know, platelet-derived growth factor, these types of things that stimulate in a fibroblastic ingrowth to the area. Cell migration comes in, collagen, which is our friend, develops, and then you get eventual healing to the tissues. The issue for the ACL, as we're all very much aware, is that you have synovial fluid. There will never be a blood clot that's going to bridge an ACL within the knee joint. And so therefore, the ACL in our world has not really been able to heal itself. And so the concept of this uh, bridge-enhanced uh, repair really sort of came from this concept. Can we bridge that proximal tibial stump to the femoral wall in hopes of having this normal cellular mediated healing process that occurs with fibroblasts and collagen to create a restored ACL. So the implant material is type one bovine collagen. Anyone that knows me well knows that I am a big fan of bovine collagen and other implants that can be used around the body as well. But this type one bovine collagen, for whatever reason, uh, the body likes it and it's hemostatic. Uh, it's resistant to breakdown of, of plasmin. So it can create that, that bridge enhanced uh, a clot that we're looking for. Uh, in addition, it holds the blood into place. It becomes malleable, so it's easy to uh, allow for implantation. And the concept is, is that this scaffold, this, this whatever you want to call it, a mushroom, but the collagen, uh, uh, not a mushroom, a marshmallow, sorry, uh, looking implant, when that blood comes on, think of it as a scaffold. Now the fibroblasts know where to go. They're going to sort of grow into this process and they can lay down collagen in an organized fashion. That's really the key, which is why, you know, range of motion and movement is important in the healing of an ACL. Uh, and then it supports a revascularization process as well. So what are the clinical benefits that, are, are, that seem to be attractive uh, to, to the idea of using this type of an implant? is you want to try to restore the anatomy and you want to try to minimize, you know, what you're taking away. So can you, can you add in this ACL in the normal uh, sort of natural orientation? I think in, in 2022, we're pretty comfortable at this point. Most people are using AM portal. Most people want to get low on the wall. Uh, they want to make sure they're not going vertical uh, and using a two-tunnel technique to be able to place these implants. And that's probably the overwhelming majority of ACL reconstructions, regardless of graft choice. Uh, and that is something that we follow with this technique as well. You're going to preserve the proprioceptive fibers of the tibial stump, which will hopefully allow this patient to have a more sense of normalcy to their knee. Again, uh, that's a thought process or theoretical. Uh, eliminates the need for the graft harvest, which as we all know, is the pain point in the patient's recovery. That's where most of their pain and discomfort comes from and can create problems such as patellar fractures, patellar tendon ruptures, uh, et cetera, there is always going to be some sort of a weakness effect when you take something away. Revisions for this type of an implant, if it does fail, uh, you're not burning any bridges. You go right to a primary ACL reconstruction. So that's always nice because these tunnels that we're drilling are really very small and really typically only the sutures are passing. And then less preoperative and intraoperative challenges it's very rare, again, in my 25 years, that somebody comes to me and says, hey, doc, we've got a new surgery, it's a new process, it's a new technique, and it turns out it's pretty darn easy to do. And that's really the case for this. The learning curve is really relatively low. You're already doing this as an ACL reconstructive surgeon. So the, the, the idea of trying to learn a new operation, such as an arthroscopic ladder J, uh, is really the, the skill point and the learning curve is much lower uh, and easier access for a skilled ACL surgeon. You can literally do this the first case and do well without much is issue or concern as far as that concern. And Dr. Kiapur is going to talk about the potential for the positive impact on the long-term health of the joint, as perhaps we might be able to prove that there may be a reduction in osteoarthritis down the line uh, with this type of an implant. So let's go through the technique. Uh, I thought we'd show everybody a few little tips and pearls here uh, so that people can feel comfortable. You assess the stump, you drill your tunnels like you normally do. These are, are relatively small tunnels. We're using a beef pin passage for this. You're gonna suture the stump. You know, the other great thing about the surgery is it's completely agnostic to industry. So whatever it is that you typically like to use, 
for, for suturing, you can use it. Whatever button you like to use, you can use it. Whatever you like to drill your tunnels with, you can use it. It's whatever you're going to feel comfortable with and it would advise using the things that you're already uh, clinically used to. After we suture the stump, we're going to pass our button on the femoral side. Uh, we then prepare the bare implant and then the implantation itself and you tie down over your buttons. So, you know, in my hands, uh, even the first case was under about 50 minutes or so. Uh, and uh, once you become adept at this, you can get this uh, surgery done in under 30 minutes. So you can see here, we're assessing our stump, we're gonna take care of any meniscal pathology that may be present. Leave your tibial stump. I think that's really important messaging here. That tibial stump is gonna give directionality uh, to where you want this implant to go. It's also going to maintain some of the nerve fibers that are in the stump as well that will hopefully regenerate as well. And so that's very helpful in the process of the, of the uh, procedure. You're going to go ahead and drill your tunnels. You drill your femoral tunnel like you normally would. Leave some of the tissue on the wall so you know where that ACL is. I typically drill right into the center of that ACL um, uh, footprint that's on, on the femoral side. And we pass that beef pin in a hyperflex position out of the AM portal. You can retrograde ream if you want. There's a lot of different ways to do it. The bottom line is for me, super simple. You can use an over the top positioning guide. You can even freehand it if you want, making sure that that foot, that that uh, femoral tunnel is gonna go through the footprint of where you're going. The tibial, you're gonna go two to three millimeters into the stump. Honestly, I don't even mind just going slightly just anterior to the stump. And you can go ahead and use a 2.4 millimeter pin, a four millimeter pin, whatever is good for you. And then you have your suture passing device ready because you certainly don't want to lose your, empty, your, your entry point. So once you drill that tibial tunnel, just be ready to rock and roll and pass your suture up and through. Because remember, your, your tunnel that you're drilling on the tibial side is relatively small, so it's not going to be easy to find. So whether you're using the flip cutter, whether you're using the twister, whatever it is that you're typically using on the tibial side, just make sure you have that suture ready to rock and roll up through that tibial tunnel uh, as well. So then the super suture stump, uh, you can see here, I like the idea of use, using a cannula in this situation. Uh, the reason I like the cannula, um, I'm not sure why my, I apologize, but my uh, cursor is not uh, coming through here, but uh, you're gonna suture your stump and then you get your sutures out of the way. Now you can certainly suture your stump first and then go ahead and pass your, your, your tibial sutures as well. If you look here just to the, to the far right, you can see white suture there, and that's the tibial tunnel suture that we can see that's present off to the side as well. And then you're gonna go ahead and take those vicral sutures that you pass through your tibial stump and you're gonna pass them up and through uh, this uh, button that's been prepared for you. The white suture you see to the right is gonna be your pulling up uh, suture through the tunnel. Your green suture to the far left is gonna be your flip suture. And then the sutures that are coming down perpendicularly, there's two sutures in there. Those are the sutures that are gonna pass through your actual implant. And you can see here, we're feeding those purple vicral sutures up in the opposite direction of the sutures that go through the implant. And we'll then go ahead and tie a knot there. And then the white suture, the purple suture, and the dark green suture all get passed up and through the femoral tunnel with a button flip. Remember, there's no math here because we're not concerned. We haven't drilled it. We're not over reaming a tunnel. It's the single tunnel that allows for the button to pass. As soon as that button flips, you are good to go. Uh, because we're not going to be tensioning on the femoral side whatsoever. It's just really the button flip. You want to maintain your purple vicral sutures, and I'm going to basically give you a quick show of that too, but those purple vicral sutures, I like to pull up and through and get them out of the way. Now, what you need to do is extend your portal so that you can have access uh, to the area here as well. Um, you can see here, uh, as we insert, we've gone ahead and we've hydrated that implant up with blood from the anesthesiologist. They typically give you about 15 cc's of whole blood, this is not PRP, and you just spread that whole blood across the implant, and then you can manipulate that in as well. Once that implant is in, uh, as much as everybody wants to take another look, you can certainly try to put your scope in, but at that point, you've got blood, you've got an implant, so most of us are not taking another look, but you extend the leg at that point, you're gonna go ahead, um, and then you, you've uh, passed your tibial uh, sutures down through your tibial tunnel, and then you tie the vicral over top on the femoral side, you extend, and then you tie down on your tibial button as well into extension. So that's it. Step by step, very straightforward. Everything that's in your wheelhouse, you're already used to doing this. Bear implant PT protocol overview. We're going to spend just a minute or two on this. What I would say to you, and I think the take-home messages from this slide in particular, is that the, the, the bare implant PT protocol is in evolution. 
And when the FDA approved the implant for the bare implant, they, imp they approved the implant. They did not necessarily approve the technique, nor did they approve the PT protocol. So if you feel that, you know, looking at the strict protocols that have been enveloped and there's been evolution from bare one to bare two into commercial, that, you know, you want to be able to try and get your patients moving faster, we would say to you, certainly use your best judgment. At this moment, uh, per, uh, per protocol overview, partial weight bearing uh, with crutches, uh, which can be weaned as four weeks. I can tell you I'm more, uh, more aggressive about that. For sure, I'm allowing my patients weight bearing early. Uh, use of a post-operative brace for six weeks with gradual increase in range of motion. Uh, again, uh, my feeling is uh, most of the patients are going to want to get out of the brace sooner rather than later. Uh, certainly protecting is not bad, but we do like range of motion. We want to have, obviously, some home exercises get going early on. Formal PT usually starts the first week to two weeks. And then physical therapy lasts based on uh, the protocols that you establish. And then return to sport is really not going to be based on a timeline as far as I'm concerned. These are just general numbers here. But, you know, it's really going to be on meeting the criteria that are required to return to sport. Now, remember, what is one of the major reasons that we have a delay to return to sport? And that is because of autographs, right? If you take somebody's BTB, if you take somebody's hamstring, if you take somebody's quad tendon, you're creating injury to the tissues. And it requires a healing response for them to get better. What we can tell you is that more often than not, these patients that undergo the bare implant feel pretty good pretty soon because they don't have that uh, pain and discomfort associated with the graft. Now, this is a... Uh, a professor from Dartmouth who found me very early on in commercialization. Uh, you can see here the MRI now uh, to the left. I got my cursor back. Thank you. Uh, is here. You can see the implant at six months. That's an organizing implant heading in the right direction. I'm feeling pretty good about it. And then over here at nine months, uh, this patient, again, has more consolidation of the graft. It's a little oblique on this video, and I apologize for that but there's even more maturation of the graph that we're identifying here. And at nine months, this patient was completely pain-free, full range of motion, Trace Lockman. And at the age of 45, we allowed him to resume his life of hiking, skiing, et cetera, uh, up in, uh, up in uh, New Hampshire. So uh, again, as we move here, here's a six-month video of another patient, again, showing an organized uh, implant heading in the right direction, uh, I show this not necessarily saying this is a fully mature ACL, but most of us feel pretty good about watching this video that, hey, that thing looks like it's doing what we had, had hoped it would, heading in the right direction, looks like it's coalesced and becoming an ACL ligament. Um, <clears throat> so evolution of bear in my practice. So started off with the concept of thinking to myself, you know, hey, self, this is an allograft replacement idea. I like that idea a lot. These are people that are not putting a lot of stress and strain onto the graft. We're going to get rid of allografts. We're going to give them a bovine natural tissue ACL restoration. Uh, and that was my thought. So that was the professor from Dartmouth. But then, you know, I'm starting to listen to my colleagues and as commercialization happened now, there's hundreds of cases that have been done and uh, colleagues across the country were demonstrating very good results with earlier patients than what we were dealing with. And so basically I've expanded now and my current age profile goes from 14 to 39. Uh, you know, when, under the 18, you know, grouping, when they come in, many of these parents are already aware of the bare implant and they're asking questions about it. So what I would say to you, you really, if you're going to be a, a true, you know, ACL surgeon that, that really, you know, tries to manage these patients and managing your graft and your age group and the, and the demands of the individual patient, I would say that, you know, you really should understand the bare implant because people are going to come in and ask you and just saying, well, I don't do that, uh, I don't think is the right answer. So spending time and energy to, to learn about this implant, whether you actually use it or not, you're going to get questions. So it makes sense to be able to do that. One of the more interesting patients that I've had <clears throat> was a patient that she was a volleyball player, Division One. For her ACL, we did a quadricep autograft on her, and she was eight months out, and she was uh, 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 doing the normal routine of getting back into sport, had a twisting injury, and she tore the ACL on her opposite knee. So she looked at me and said, you know, I really don't want to go through this thing again. It was a lot of hard work, especially with that graft. So we started talking about the bare implant, and she chose the bare implant. So it's a real fascinating in vivo little randomized controlled trial that we're running right now on the same patient. And without a doubt, she's loving her bare implant early on because of the lack of pain and discomfort and her much faster recovery that she's experienced compared to the opposite side. 
And for me in particular, you know, whether it's a mid-substance tear, avulsion, uh, or even a partial in my hands, uh, I'm treating all tear patterns. I'm not restricting uh, the choice of this graft to tear pattern. Uh, so, you know, thank you very much, everyone. It was just sort of my thoughts here. We're going to open up to question and answers in a little bit. But before that, we're going to have uh, Dr. Kiapur give his Bear One OA assessment talk for about a few uh, slides here, and then we'll certainly open it up to questions. All yours, Dr. Kiapur. Thank you very much, Dr. Sigmund. So I'm going to talk about some of the early uh, results that we have seen in Bear One. These are limited sample size, just purely qualitative observations. And as we are moving along with additional Bear trials, we hope to have more concrete data, which uh, kind of like led us to do some stats and to see if there are benefits in terms of like uh, lowering the risk of PTOA in a joint degeneration. So can I go to the next slide? Okay, so before going to, into clinical data, so I'm just going to kind of like review some of the preclinical evidence that we have seen. And uh, uh, can, I, can I go back? Okay. So, so this is this is the study, a long-term study that we have done in a large animal model, the Sepigny, where we have simulated ACL injury through cutting the ACL. And on the left, you see that uh, at, at one year, there is decent amount of cartilage degeneration, cartilage loss in these knees, kind of like mimicking a very late stage osteoarthritis. In the center, we see that if we do ACL reconstruction, these, uh, this, uh, knee, uh, these pigs develop uh, some significant osteoarthritis at the point of one year. And on the right, we see that if the ones that you have been treated with bridge enhanced ACL restoration, they kind of like had very little amount of cartilage degeneration and osteoarthritis. And now we are trying to see if this can be kind of like replicated in our human subjects within the trials. So we have looked at this, if you can go to the next slide, please. So we have looked at this through two different imaging outcomes. One is the traditional X-ray AP cineflex reviews where we are measuring the joint space fees as uh, joint space width, as well as some KL grades to uh, basically evaluate any formation of osteophytes, loss of joint space width, any uh, kind of like uh, bony erosion or any other signs of uh, degeneration and osteoarthritis. So again, this is a limited sample size. Each, each uh, kind of a group is, has an N of five. So we have five bears versus five ACLRs at the six years. And we have also evaluated the two years imaging data. So next slide, please. So when we look at these knees with regard to uh, KL grading, on the top, we are comparing each of these groups at two years. So the first thing we see on the left are the bears at two years and ACLRs at two years. So although not statistically significant, even at two years, we saw we had higher number of ACLR knees who ended up having KL grades above, one and above. And But when we go to six years, we see that except one, most of the bear knees are at zero, uh, at KL zero grade, whereas all of the ACLRs have some sort of, uh, have, have some signs of osteoarthritis and early degeneration. Although these are very early on, they are not at the level of total joint loss, joint space with loss, but we see some of these phenotypes such as osteophytes and bony erosions. And when we look at the changes in trajectory of the uh, OA development in between the groups, we see that there are more of these ACLRs who are advancing between two years and six years. Again, we are seeing some very pilot data and limited sample size. Can we go to the next slide? We have also done uh, MRIs on, on these knees at both of the time points. And this is the same thing that we are currently doing at Bear 2 and Bear 3 as well. And using these MRIs, we've been able to basically reconstruct the 3D morphology of the articular cartilage across the femur as well as tibia and patella. And we have done some 3D mapping to see if we can identify any patterns of cartilage loss or thinning between these two groups. If you go to the next slide. So on the left, we are basically looking at the cartilage thickness maps for the bear group. And on the right, we look at the same uh, thickness maps for the ACLRs. And these are the average thickness maps for both of these groups. On the top is patella, then femur condyles, and la medial lateral tibial plateau. And as you can see, although it's very early on again, we see that there are more regions 
our, or bigger areas of these cartilage uh, lesions or thinnings in the ACLRs compared to bears. Again, we got to look at this as pilot data. We definitely need larger sample size and maybe longer follow-up to see how different these two treatments are going to be. But so far, these early observations are in line with the preclinical data that we have seen, which uh, we saw higher amounts of cartilage loss and lesions in ACLRs compared to bears. That's all I had. Thank you. All right. So my cursor is not still doing very well here, Joe. Are you able to run the question and answer for me? Because I can't get up there. Looks like I'm even having a hard time. Uh, let me see here. Oh, there we go. I'm going to stop sharing. How's that? Good. All right. Question and answers. What is the cost of implants? What CP code do you use? What is your approval denial by insurance? Um, so the codes are 29888. It's just an ACL reconstructive code is what we typically utilize. Uh, the cost of the implant, that's not something that I'm very comfortable talking about, but I would say that uh, the overwhelming majority of the patients that I want to operate on, we operate on and it gets done. Uh, so I'm not sure if, Nicole, you want to give any commentary on that? Oh, um, so thank you. I would, um, I'll defer to your local rep. So they will be in, in contact with you um, and your local reps could work through uh, pricing for your facility. But thanks for the question. Oh, come on, everybody. I answered everybody's, nobody has any questions. Where's Gladstone? Is he on here? Come on. You were going to give me a hard time. I'm going to give you a hard time. <laughs> I don't see it. Anybody see anything there? All right, Scott Bissell, there we go. Do you anything different than the notch if it's narrow? Yeah, standard notch plasty. As a general rule, um, you know, I'm trying not to, to, to create much more of, a, of injury to the tissues than I need to. Um, so, you know, as far as visualization is concerned, I usually just do visualization notch plasty anyway. Uh, so I would say dealer's choice on that, Scott, uh, but you can certainly... Uh, uh, you know, go ahead and make a little bit more as well. Uh, what about older patients like 45 to 55? I think the bear implant, you know, uh, Laura, is the perfect allograft replacement, right? I don't think there's ever a reason to do an allograft ever again, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I think that uh, the data here looks really good. These are patients that are going to be older. They're going to have even less demand uh, than would be the kids that are out on the pitch at 18 and 19. So for me in particular, uh, I have no problem in that age group. Uh, Tyler Welch, do you use Ethibon for your internal brace? So, you know, we're not using an internal brace, you know, but a lot of people do. Dealer's choice. And I would tell you, you know, whatever you decide you want to do. Uh, uh, so you mentioned using IKDC scores. How are those scores versus the ACLR? Again, Nicole, you're more up to date on the specifics of, of the research. You're certainly welcome to answer that question. unless you don't want to. <laughs> you're, you're muted. Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. um, sorry, could, could, is that one on the, oh, mention the IKDC, IKDC scores, is that the one? Yeah, how do they do versus the standard ACL reconstruction, maybe in bear oh, two? Yeah, so um, in our bear two, we had two primary endpoints and those two primary endpoints um, were both met and equivalent. One was the IKDC and one was the, um, AP knee, uh, AP knee laxity scores, and those it was equivalency study, and we showed equivalency to ACLR. Excellent. Uh, well said. Do you have time frame to use the, uh, the for the injury to the implant? It's what is it? Fifty two days, Nicole? Is that the number, or am I off by a day or two? Yeah, it's about fifty days is the recommendation. Um, it's it's um, an RIFU is fifty days as a recommendation. Perfect which gives you enough time, honestly. I mean, at this point, I've actually aborted from, you know, the idea of waiting for full range of motion. I have take care of a lot of Division One collegiate athletes. They need their own scholarship. They need to get going as quickly as possible. So literally, for example, I'm operating, you know, tomorrow on one of my Division One lacrosse players who tore ACL five days ago. So, you know, we're just trying to get these patients done in a timely fashion. But if there is a delay in getting to you, 
then, you know, 50 days is the cutoff. But I think, again, that is not a hard cutoff. Uh, if you have a patient that looks like they have a viable tibial stump, then I would say certainly uh, preparing yourself to be able to do a bear implant is a good one. And that actually is a great segue uh, into Scott's. And then I'm going to go back to Chrissy Kane's question. But for Scott, have there been any patients that you plan the bear on, but intraoperatively changed to a standard reconstruction? The answer is no. But what I would say is if you get in there and there's no tibial stump, for whatever reason, if you got to them a little bit later um, and, uh, you know, you get in there and there's no stump, I would abort and do a standard ACL reconstruction. Without that stump, I don't think you have the directionality to be able to make sure the graft is going in the right place. Uh, Chrissy's question is, are you doing MRI post-ops on everyone? If so, when? I mean, at this stage in my career, considering I've done less than 10, I think I'm at number seven. The answer is yes. I want to see MRIs to see how these patients are doing. Uh, and uh, I would say uh, at six months, it's very reasonable to get an MRI to make sure you're feeling pretty good about the process of, and the direction in which the patient's going. Right, you don't want to pick, take them out beyond six months and then say, "Oh, by the way, we got an MRI at nine months. This thing didn't work, and now you need an ACL reconstruction." So, basically, I that would be my philosophy. There is the implant wrapping around the native ACL tissue or laying on top of the tissue. I think it's actually laying on top of the tissue, Michael. Uh, and I think that what happens though is that's good enough to create that bridge from the tibial stump uh, through the collagen implant and up to the femoral area as well. Uh, I think the body has an idea of what it needs to do. Uh, it just needs some help in getting there. And that's where this implant rolls into place. Uh, Sean Kelly, the Viking uh, warrior from Colorado, is it worth using an internal brace? Uh, I would say to you, dealer's choice on that, uh, but certainly an option. And if you feel comfortable with that, go for it. Uh, Wayne uh, Bonkowski, when returning to sport, are you recommending continue wearing a sports brace? If so, do you have them wear it forever or only for a certain time? For me, I think it's all about, you know, the same concepts that we're doing for standard ACL reconstruction. In my hands, I have them typically wearing a brace uh, for their first year uh, in competitive sports after their ACL reconstruction, then allow them to make their choice, you know, beyond that for sure. Ken Brooks, how are you, Ken? Nice to see you. Uh, do you perform ALL reconstruction on any of these cases, any issues with knees that have hyperextension or other dysplasias? I think the issue about deciding whether or not you're going to do an ALL or, or an, LD, an, an L, um, LET, a lateral extraarticular tenodesis, I think that's up to the individual you know, situation of the patient. If they have that hyperlaxity and you're concerned about that, I think that's fine. But that decision for me is going to be made on the laxity of the patient and not on the graft choice. Uh, that's just my thought process there. Laura, again, why, uh, why was that the bond for sutures recommendation versus the stiffer sutures fiber wire or ortho cord equivalent? Uh, I think the idea is that the ethabon is, is permanent, but honestly, uh, I don't feel strong one way or the other. Do I want silicone for fiber wire in there? I don't know. Uh, but certainly, you know, I wouldn't say to you that that would be adverse uh, one way or the other. That's up to you. Uh, uh, Bill Ulmer, on my first case, I filed the reprint, it was written, and my patient got stiff, and now is stuck at 110 degrees at about nine weeks post-op. Uh, I would get that patient moving, and if they're not moving well enough, then I would consider a manipulation on that patient uh, for sure. Uh, I think that's a valid point, William, and I think that's one of the reasons that we're getting together. We're going to get a lot of key opinion leaders in a room. We're going to whiteboard it out. We're going to have conversations, for me in particular, I allow my patients to be weight bearing as tolerated. Um, I allow for earlier range of motion, you know, uh, upwards in the first week or two, maybe only 30 to 60, but we get them out to 90 as quickly as we can. So I'm on board with you on that, but we're certainly going to uh, share whatever revised protocols that we have. Do you uh, just incorporate the Cyclops or clean the edge? You know, I think if it's a dead piece of Cyclops that's, that's floating out in the front, usually with those Cyclopses, Usually there's some other tissue behind it. Um, and so you're definitely going to want to incorporate the stump. Uh, I think those sutures into the stump for directionality are important uh, for sure. And if you can get the Cyclops in there, you know, why not? I, I wouldn't have a problem with that. That was speed dating.
What about you, Sean Rocket? What are you thinking, brother? You're very welcome, Peter. I don't know. What do you guys think? We good? Yeah, maybe we could just give it another quick minute. No, everyone. Well, let's take another one. Just jump in. How about you know? How about Mark Pietropelli? Mark, why don't you give us some of your thoughts? You've done a lot of these. You're over ten at this point. What's your uh, What's your thoughts on rehab in particular? I'd love to hear your thoughts. You can maybe type them out. Uh, so, Scott, do you clean the femoral side at all before passing the suture to the femur? Not really. You know, just a little bit, just for visualization, because I want to make sure that my guide pin's going in the right place. I'll use a 7.5 guide pin typically through the AM portal in a hyperflex position. Again, it's super easy. You, you know, it just has a, a tendency to sort of find its right place. And remember, you're not reaming over top of that as well. It's just the guide pin, and you're passing a suture for, for graft passage as well. Uh, do you do anything with the femoral stump? Again, I'm going to leave as much of that, I'll, I'll leave as much of the femoral stump as we can. Uh, I want to be able to make sure that the pin's going in the right place. Uh, and again, as much tissue to sort of bridge across, I think is uh, is a good way to go. There you go. So Dr. Pietropoli has seen a similar event as far as the patient that asked about their 110 at nine weeks. Don't worry too much about it. We've had patients up to a year now and they all get their range of motion back. So uh, Dr. Pietropoli is, uh, would recommend patience and continued range of motion and movement uh, for that individual patient. Thanks, Mark. So Sean Kelly's asking, he's done one so far. Any thoughts from anyone incorporating a primary repair into the equation? You know, everybody can type in if they want. My thought is if you're going to do a primary repair, do a primary repair. Uh, if it's the type of ACL, you know, tear pattern that has that avulsion type pattern, uh, I think you're going to have a lot of stuff in the way if you're going to try and do both. Remember, you're going to have to pass sutures up and through for the bare implant with a... Um, uh, with a button on the outside, plus the suture anchors that you're putting into the femoral uh, zone of where you're going to be doing the repair, I would be worried about real estate. I would say pick and choose and do the one that you want to do. Is there something different about the bear implant that you don't trust a clinical exam and therefore get the MRI at six months? No, I think, Scott, I think the answer to, to that would be, you know, when I've done 30 of these and, and I know and I'm feeling really comfortable based on what I've seen, at the six month endpoint that I probably, you know, may not get an MRI on everyone at this point. Uh, but to be perfectly honest, I'd like to know how my patients are doing as I learn about this technique. I want to make sure that uh, I'm, I'm providing, you know, solid advice to my patients.